I'd like to begin this interview by asking you to speak a little about your life growing up, first in India and then in Pakistan. Um, you first arrived in India with your mother and your father when you were two years old. And so I'd like to ask you uh, where you lived and what was it like to grow up there at the time. Um, as I mentioned, there's, uh, you know, in asking these questions, I'm wondering to what extent do you see your encounter with colonialism? during your youth as having shaped some of your later concerns. So this may or may not be important. I don't remember very much, uh, of course, about my life before the war, the Second World War. I do remember that uh, we moved from um, place to place, in fact, and eventually spent quite a lot of time in Lahore, which is in the Punjab, uh, and eventually, of course, became the most important city in Pakistan. But um, this was before uh, the partition of India, as it's called. So I don't remember very much about it, except that uh, there were all sorts of uh, friends who, were, uh, who used to come to the house. My mother took some time learning Urdu because, of course, she couldn't speak it and uh, had lots of people to, to help her. And they were all really very, very uh, pleased with the fact that she came from the Prophet's city, after all, Medina, which, uh, where she grew up, although she was born in Hail, which is in the center of Arabia. But she grew up in Medina, which is where I was born. And so, of course, for uh, Indian Muslims, this was... Uh, a wonderful place to come from and they were very helpful to her and gradually she learnt Urdu uh, and of course uh, that was very early on I'm trying to remember now what else uh, happened I, I do remember uh, that on the 4th of September 1939 which you may or may not uh, remember was, of course, one day after the outbreak of the war in Europe, not in the United States, which came in much later, but in Europe. It was the 3rd of September. So on the 4th of September, my father was arrested because he was an Austrian citizen. And uh, the police came, and, and I remember they were uh, very moved themselves. They were Indian Muslims, and they were unhappy about having to do this, but this was their duty, and, and they took him away. And then my mother and I went to um, a very close friend of ours, an Indian Muslim, who had a very large estate in uh, part of eastern Punjab. And uh, we stayed there for about a year, year and a half. And then my mother was arrested as well and taken to a family camp um, and uh, of course I, I went with her. So those are my very early memories, not, not very much more than that except that we were in Lahore, I remember. And, um, and the same with being in uh, the internment camp to which my father eventually came because he was in a men's camp uh, during the war and when his wife came they uh, uh, allowed him to join his wife and his, his son and uh, that's where we spent the rest of the war but I also went to school at that time and was sent for the first time to a boarding school after my father arrived and uh, that was really quite traumatic for me I hated doing that uh, but uh, I was taken to that missionary school it was there were um, Scottish missionaries and I was one of the very few Muslims there. And I remember there was a, um, a some kind of a, a fracas, some kind of a, uh, a problem, because I refused categorically to go, as all the children were supposed to go, on Sundays to chapel. And I said, no, I'm a Muslim, I don't uh, go to. And of course they said, yes, you must. Uh, and so on, and then I think my father had eventually to come and um, ask for special conditions so that I didn't have to go. Uh, 
and uh, it was an interesting time after the uh, war uh, we moved this camp was in southwest India not far from from Bombay and Pune in fact and then uh, we went up to north again to uh, the Punjab where most of my father's friends were and uh, fairly soon after that we we went to the hills the Himalayas where we spent about a year and a half or so before partition uh, because my father found the heat of the uh, the plains really quite intense as you can imagine you know it was 40 degrees or something like that in the, in the great heat so uh, we spent the whole year there uh, until partition and then my father came down we all came down to what became Pakistan and uh, both in that place in, in Dalhousie I remember there were some people who came to visit my father and uh, that was a time when he also produced a kind of an irregular uh, journal one man's journal as he called it called Arafat which was intended for you know uh, questions of, of uh, Islamic reform and so on uh, and became quite influential and I also had a had a, a tutor who was manager also of my father's uh, journal who was an Austrian uh, called Mr. Krenick who taught me while I was there uh, and managed the uh, the journal so after that we we came to Lahore and and there I went to another school called St. Anthony's and um, uh, that was a day school and there too I remember mm, lots of people coming uh, to our home uh, to visit my father and talk to him about questions of of Islamic reform and uh, of uh, the future of Islam and so on because my father at that stage had become quite famous of course for having written first of all his most uh, best known book at the time which was Islam at the Crossroads uh, and then the other things that he wrote in the uh, journal Arafat so there was a lot of coming and going um, and my father eventually became was asked to head an institute uh, of Islamic research and reform which he did uh, where he also wrote some uh, elaborate suggestions for a constitution for Pakistan. It must have been an interesting time in Pakistan, given right after its founding. Um, you were a high school student. Yes. What uh, do you remember? A sort of a, you know, a kind of natural enthusiasm that among students or teachers or. What were, do you remember discussions with fellow students or the way in which the founding of the new nation was an issue for people at the time? I think there was quite a lot of excitement, yes, uh, and quite a lot of uh, hope at the time uh, of uh, something new and exciting uh, to, be, to be built. But I, I left fairly early, you know. I left in 1950. So that was just three years after the founding of Pakistan. Um, I went to, to Britain, first of all to do um, architecture, which was my father's choice for me, not my own. And, um, and then eventually when I found this was not what I wanted to do, I uh, did anthropology. But there was, yes, there was a lot of uh, a sense of, of building a new uh, country and a new society and so on I had uh, to live away from Pakistan for a long time and to read more about the history of uh, both India and, pa and what became Pakistan to then develop my own ideas about the um, as it were the, s 
what I would now call the soundness of uh, having a, a separate state uh, for Indian Muslims. It's a complicated story which I don't want to go into here and it's of course quite well known to to people who are scholars of, of the area. <coughs> but eventually certainly uh, I came to the conclusion that uh, it was a mistake. But it was a mistake that wasn't the result of one person, uh, one person's decision. It was the mistake of, of a number of people in the different parties and so on to establish a separate state because there were still a large number of Muslims who had to remain in, in India. And I think that um, something much more challenging uh, could have arisen had all the Muslims in India remained within India at the time. It would have been more complicated, but it certainly would have been, I think, uh, a more challenging kind of development instead of having a, a state which was simply for uh, Muslims. Let me ask you a couple more questions that are about your early life. And one is about your mother. And if you could say a little bit about what she was like and what memories you have of her growing up and what language did you speak with her and mm. she influential, let's say, in your religious education? Yes, of course. My mother was, was uh, as I said, uh, somebody who took a little while adjusting to India, and she was very unhappy for a long time, of course, being away from uh, her native uh, city and her, her family and so on. But <coughs> I think the fact that you know there were so many very welcoming Muslim families at the time did help her. My own earliest uh, communication w with her was of course in Arabic. Hence my, my first language uh, was a child's Arabic uh, with my mother. Uh, but I really didn't of course uh, get any education within uh, uh, an Arabic speaking institution. It was all eventually English speaking. But that was that was what I spoke with her, and I even spoke with my father in Arabic uh, at first. And it wasn't until the war, when I went to this English school, that I became more fluent in English, and and then uh, he too had developed his English to a point where he found that this was the first language uh, in which he would write. And um, I spoke to him eventually in English. But my mother was was a, a very pious woman uh, and I think that uh, in some respects she had uh, less uh, of a clear idea of the kinds of of uh, reforms that my father had in mind <coughs> um, because for her Islam was something that you lived uh, rather than an intellectual project as it had been really for my father uh, and uh, she thought of of Islam as, as uh, not as something out there that one that one uh, followed carefully uh, but as as a way of living in, in which she had been taught and I think um, both her, her piety and her sense of her religion as something that is lived uh, also often without thought, not always because you had to be sure that you were you were not transgressing in all sorts of ways but by and large that was primarily what it was for her and as I say this was a very different approach if you like from that of my father who was an intellectual uh, and for whom uh, Islam had always been uh, you know, a wonderful uh, solution to many of the problems of of uh, the modern world, uh, if properly applied, and so on. And this was not, uh, as I say, my mother's view. So that uh, I think percolated in me as well. Um, and the, as you know, later on, I, the idea that uh, religion was to be thought of in terms of certain explicit beliefs and so on <coughs> was something that 
I was uh, eventually skeptical of and wrote against and uh, the seeds of that I think came from um, living with my mother which I did also during the first year or so a couple of years uh, of the war with her alone did you ever receive any sort of uh, formal religious education were you ever oh yes definitely uh, you know I had I had uh, not only um, to memorize uh, certain uh, surahs of the, of the Quran and so on but I was taught and here both by my mother and my father I was taught uh, the proper way to pray uh, the, the necessities of, of fasting uh, and what one does and why one fasts and of course I heard um, my father talk quite a lot if you can call that sort of form of religious education about uh, the significance of hadith in relation to the Quran and which aspects of the hadith are relevant uh, for uh, modern uh, Muslims because uh, fundamentally as he argued uh, it was really in an interpretative sense that uh, hadith was to be taken uh, primarily and that is those aspects of the Quran that were not uh, explicitly clear should then be clarified by reference to a hadith. So he didn't think of uh, hadith, of course, as, as something which had equal uh, value with, with the Quran and had a, had a different view also, of, therefore, the foundations, if you like, of, of Islamic uh, tradition. S and that he talked about <coughs> quite a lot to me. And although it wasn't done uh, in school, I didn't receive any formal schooling in these matters, but I did receive uh, an enormous amount of, of uh, information and uh, formation of attitudes and so on uh, through the talks that uh, my father and I had together. We often used to go for walks. My father loved to go walking every day and he would always or often take me along with him and of course it was a it was almost a kind of uh, exercise for me to uh, listen to him uh, talking about all sorts of things including Europe and what he called European civilization Islam Islamic civilization uh, and the possibilities of Islam and so on so there was there was uh, there was a lot of that uh, that that I heard from him and that he taught me quite explicitly uh, to bear in mind and so on. Um, you mentioned a certain, that you had memories of your father meeting with, let's say, prominent Muslim figures at the time. And um, how much did his sort of growing prominence color your own early life or imprint on your domestic life in ways? Was it a, something you have a, a strong memory of? Or know that the father was uh, playing such an important role? Oh, I certainly knew that um, and certainly various people uh, as I said used to come to our home to talk about various Islamic issues but and also he went to see various uh, prominent uh, Muslim thinkers. I have a memory of uh, us going once because we were invited by Abu Ala al Maududi and uh, spent a whole afternoon once there talking to him. I mean, not me, but uh, my father was. So, people like that. Um, uh, Iqbal was somebody whom I never met, but I knew that he had had uh, a friendship with him before the war. So that uh, uh, there was a consciousness of the fact that that he was an important uh, Islamic thinker that was certainly that was certainly the case but as I said fairly soon afterwards I I did leave fairly soon after the uh, establishment of Pakistan I left Pakistan for London and there of course I had uh, very different kinds of 
of uh, experiences and things to, to deal with. Why, why don't we take up that question then? What, 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 uh, both what did you go there expecting, sort of assumptions that you have or ideas about the place, and what did you find that, that uh, well, the way you thought? Yeah, I think one of the things, for some reason, that I grew up with uh, in Pakistan was that um, some aspects of, of, of that society at the time seemed to me to be rather restrictive. I, I was fairly young then, 17, and uh, it was not surprising that I should have had um, certain kinds of, of qualms about about that kind of society. And somehow, from both from my schooling education and, and my independent reading, uh, I developed a certain idea about uh, the West, which was in some ways contrary to, to my father. Uh, and that is that it was the center of uh, freedom, of enlightenment, of justice and fairness uh, of uh, all the, the, the sort of values that might appeal to uh, a young growing boy. Um, my father was much more skeptical of that, having lived in Europe, uh, of course, and, and uh, trying to tell me that Europe wasn't quite like that. But I, had, uh, I, was, uh, I was very much taken by that idea. And of course, when I arrived, Really, it's a long, long story from 1950 onwards, uh, when I arrived in, in Britain. It was a slow process and at times a very rapid process of disillusionment. Uh, and I discovered, as I've said also to friends, uh, you know, I reinvented the wheel by discovering that the British were as biased and as prejudiced as anybody else uh, that I had uh, originally not realized. And the uh, moments when I was uh, particularly uh, shocked, I might say, by many of the reactions were political. The first one was in 1956 with the invasion, uh, the trilateral invasion into uh, Egypt and uh, the reaction of, of, of people, quite a lot of people, who were uh, very anti, of course, the Egyptians at the time. And the second and even more important one was in 1967. Uh, and that was really quite a shock for me uh, because I realized that there was a sense on, in the part of far too many people of almost a kind of... Uh, vicarious revenge which had been inflicted on Egypt by Israel, uh, a revenge that was necessary according to certainly the British because they had been humiliated in 1956 and had to withdraw, as you know, politically. So uh, the, the, the reaction was really quite astonishing uh, on the part of uh, an awful lot of people, most of the people that I encountered, people on the left as well as on the right and, and so on, who um, idealized, uh, of course, this, this, this wonderful democratic state of Israel uh, and had nothing but uh, um, really dislike and, and, and so on for Egypt primarily, but also for much of the Middle East uh, and the Muslim world. So I slowly realized that um, really uh, I had developed a kind of, you know, ideal model in my mind about what um, uh, the West was like and that the reality was much more complicated and uh, uh, needed to be looked at much more critically than I had done. Were there beyond these key political moments, were there other example, uh, experiences at the university or as a student or just in getting to know people in Britain that, um, that 
increasingly reshaped your thought about the, the wonderful qualities of the West, or like in your daily encounters with the British people you met? Well, I think I, I became more aware of uh, a, a latent racism, uh, uh, which was sometimes not latent, uh, but often quite explicit, which also surprised me. Um, so that was, that was a, a general uh, recognition of, of a complexity that I hadn't originally thought about, and which extended even beyond uh, the Muslim world to the, what we used to call in those days the third world. Uh, some of my encounters were like that, uh, not all of them. I had certainly very good friends, uh, English friends, um, and eventually, of course, as uh, you know my, my wife, uh, I, I married an English woman, so um, it was not it was not that I had, uh, you know, a, a, a total distancing, but certainly a much more critical view of the expectations that the British had um, in relation to the Third World in general and, and Muslims in particular. So that my interest also in the entire experience of, of colonialism was uh, extended at that time and deepened, I think and uh, the degree to which it had affected the contemporary history of Britain uh, and, of course, of other colonial countries was uh, something that, that uh, developed at that time, and I was aware of it at that time. Uh, let me ask you then about your work in the Middle East. Um, now you do the, the first work, field work you did for your doctoral dissertation was in the Sudan. Um, why did you choose the Sudan and also uh, why didn't you go to Pakistan even when you had come from there and what led you to choose Sudan in the beginning? I think, well, this is, this is uh, a slightly more complicated uh, question as to, as to why I chose to go to Sudan rather than uh, to Pakistan. I did at one stage uh, think briefly that I might find something um, to do in Pakistan but in those days the uh, facilities financial possibilities for doing field work in Britain were not very considerable that's one point um, the other is that my parents had both left Pakistan at the time so I had no relatives uh, there anymore um, my mother eventually, after my parents uh, were di uh, divorced, uh, my mother went back to Saudi Arabia uh, to her own family. And I was um, more and more caught up with a rather generalized uh, view of the West towards uh, the Third World, as it were. I know that it's not very fashionable to talk about the West, but, uh, but this is a complicated um, problem which uh, one can talk about later on, and I have uh, talked about it in some of my writings. But I was uh, more and more involved in the immediate political crises that uh, connected Britain at the time with the Middle East. Uh, as I've mentioned, the 56 invasion and then the 67 invasion and so on. So that it was not um, it was not immediately Pakistan that was in my ken, both for personal reasons because I had um, no family there anymore, and indeed when my mother went back to Saudi Arabia, I used to visit her uh, every year. I tried to stay there for a month, but normally not more than about a couple of weeks, uh, at least, to to see how she was, but. Um, the connection with the Sudan had to do with my uh, being in Oxford University at the time and uh, Oxford had an informal connection but very close connection with the Sudan because the many of the people in the uh, anthropology 
uh, Institute were people who had worked in, in the Sudan as anthropologists and indeed my own supervisor uh, for my uh, PhD was uh, Evans Pritchard who uh, of course had uh, not only worked there but had been briefly in, in Egypt as well, had taught in Egypt for about a year or so um, and had written a very famous book on, on Libya which uh, we all read as students. So uh, it was part of a, a recruitment drive that the then head of the department who was also himself a graduate of, of Cambridge I think but had very close links with, with Oxford as well who came uh, almost every summer to see if there were young graduates who would be who could be persuaded to come to uh, Khartoum University and both teach and have a guaranteed period of research for them in the field in, in the Sudan. And so I accepted a five-year contract which was extended slightly by about three months uh, at the very end. So I was there for uh, fi over five years from 61 to 66, the end of 66, when I returned to Britain. How did you find life there? Or how did uh, the extensive period you spent there shape, let's say, your appreciation of the Middle East or the kinds of questions you later came to pursue? Well, I, I must say the period I spent there w was absolutely marvelous. I, uh, I think of it as, as, as one of the happiest uh, periods in my life. Uh, I loved the Sudanese I met. They are uh, an extremely um, uh, amiable, uh, interesting, witty, uh, relaxed uh, kind of, of uh, people, if one may generalize about a whole people in this way. Uh, but uh, and I made lots of friends from among them uh, and I was of course uh, very excited to to do some work in in uh, northern Kordofan as it was uh, among uh, uh, a nomadic uh, uh, group it was uh, it was altogether a period of of, um, of uh, for me of discovery both about the uh, the Middle East, because we always went via Egypt, incidentally, and spent a little time um, in the summers uh, I in Egypt, on the way to uh, to Britain, where we were entitled to spend the summers uh, by our con in accordance with our contract. And um, it was it was um, altogether an absolutely delightful time, and and uh, I liked the students. I don't know what else I can say at the moment. But this must have been when, uh, right really at the very beginning of uh, the Islamic revival movement in Sudan, or pretty slightly before, but, and you went back I think in the mid-70s or something, where it must have been more pronounced, that movement. Do you remember anything about, given your interest in Islam, do you have a, a sense of developments either among uh, Muslim friends or intellectuals or uh, conversations at the university or a sense of a, a growing movement at the time and did it change over the period of, you know, since you first went and you later returned? There wasn't of course a, a, a full grown uh, Islamist movement in uh, the Sudan at the time. Uh, I was there first for the long period. But uh, later on, of course, it did grow. And I went there briefly in 1970. I went back actually spending much of the time in the field with, with the Kababish with whom I had done my field research. And, uh, but then I spent uh, a semester, or the equivalent of a semester, in 1975 in Khartoum, by which time, of course, there was much more consciousness. But let me say something about the earlier period. Uh, I do remember at the time talking to a number of, of uh, friends who taught at the university, Sudanese, uh, and who uh, were uh, largely on the left, uh, 
uh, considered themselves to be socialist. Uh, and I remember um, arguing with them about the necessity of having to come to terms with uh, the Islamic heritage, uh, both uh, as a heritage and uh, as a religion. And I remember um, at that time, too, arguing with some of them who had begun to say, uh, as they did in Egypt, um, that uh, perhaps the left has been a bit too precipitate in dismissing uh, the heritage of the overwhelming majority uh, of the population and they ought to come to uh, terms with that and be a little more understanding. Uh, and I remember uh, conversations we had, which I've had since then as well, with other people in, in parallel situations, uh, about the difference between what I would say was a, a, a tactical accommodation. Uh, that is, look, we have to uh, be a little more polite uh, about Islam uh, because otherwise we won't have any real influence on the majority of the people who happen to be Muslims, uh, which I would say is a tactical adjustment. Or uh, a more serious engagement with them and with with Islam, in which one has to also rethink one's own position uh, uh, as somebody politically committed, uh, but uh, as a Muslim in a Muslim society, uh, 